Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning, Ron. How are you this morning? Good. Okay. Um, I see you're in your familiar uh, Ron Carter Media Center. Yes, um, my natural habitat. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ron, since the covert intermission, uh, which you term, uh, you've become um, somewhat of a media personality. My goodness, I've seen your interviews with uh, uh, Lenny White, Herbie Hancock, Pat Metheny. Um, what inspired you to go online? Well, three people who trust my judgment and who I'm forced to trust theirs thought that the more I stay in my natural habitat and then continue hibernating, that no one would know who I was of the people who were supposed to know who I was. <laughs> and uh, they convinced me that they would trust my image and my responsibility and my, my history. And when I said no, I would mean really no. Mm -hmm. And when I say yes, that means I'm trusting them as far as we could tr trust each other, given this <laughs> beginning mission. And uh, it's working out pretty well, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I enjoyed your interview with Herbie, uh, talking about how uh, Zoom has now become part of our lives. And uh, yeah. it, it is a great tool to be able to talk to people that you wouldn't ordinarily have the opportunity to connect with. Well, I think more important for me, uh, it allows me to teach students somewhere other than a block from my house. Yeah. True, true. <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> I, have a student, I have a student who's uh, lives in Greece, so he has a lesson at uh, 7 a.m. New York time because it's like 6 p.m. there or something like, sure. something like that. And uh, he's such a wonderful player, he needs some help, and that's my job. So if he were not on Zoom, I would never know he existed. What are some of the dynamics when you teach on Zoom? Obviously, it's not the same as being there in person. It's really difficult, given everything yeah. that's involved, the, the, the local Wi-Fi, the, the uh, system, sure. the, the, stereo, the uh, uh, internet system, uh, how many people are using it at the time we're using his, using his, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, sure. What kind of gear does he have to allow me to get the best sound from him through the right. system, uh, can I can I accept? At some point, he's going to be frozen, and for twenty bars, I, for twenty bars, I will hear nothing what he's doing. I'm trying to follow <laughs> my score. I mean, it's fraught with difficulty. Our job, our meaning the 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 teaching the teaching collective, has to find a way to understand what that is and understand that it's a different ball game now. The other big issue is that I've, I've found in this uh, one of my and then we knew another phrase is it's the bane of my existence is that the academic teachers give the students more work because they think that that now they're at their home now that they are at their home they have much more time to do to pile on the work extra math extra assignments extra research extra term papers that means that something suffers and i refuse to accept that the base lessons and practice will be one of those things that suffer so I keep telling those guys, so give those guys one less chapter to read, and I will give them one less etude. We'll be even. Well, I'll tell you something. Uh, last month, uh, exactly, I, I guess a month ago today, when you did your last Zoom, uh, there was a young lady who hadn't practiced her bass in a year. Do you remember that? No, but continue the story. I'm interested. Okay, so you <laughs> mentioned to her that best thing for her to do was to take one etude and finish it, yep. complete it. Okay. And I thought that was such an incredible response because, you know, when, when you're home alone all the time, you're like, oh, I'll read this. Oh, I'll read that. But that doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect. And your point was, I don't care if it takes an hour, an hour and a half. To get back into what you're doing, practice one a day and get it perfect. I just thought that was fabulous. Well, you know, I'm not above doing it myself. You know, when I'm, when we were traveling, remember that word, traveling? Um, yeah. When we were on the road. Verb? Yeah, went on, on the road, I felt like the guy with the stick on my back and, and the... A, 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 a bag on the, a bag on the end. Uh, when I get home, now that we are, at the time we couldn't take our own base, of course, and we were kind of either the base du jour 
or we decided to take our own fold-up travel base. My job when I got home was to take my base out of my case and practice an R1 on A scale until I got it perfect. It didn't take, it didn't matter how long it took. It didn't matter how awful it started out. I just knew that within an hour, I had to nail this specific scale. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it wasn't just for the discipline of doing it. It's to know where my bass had those notes located. And when you play different basses, that the curvature of the strings are different, the right. curvature of the fingerboard is different, the length of the fingerboard is different, the height yeah. of the bass is different, the kind of strings are different. All those factors are in a way of it not being my bass. Yeah. But no one wants to know that it's not my bass. They hired me to do a specific job, which is to lead, in this case, lead a trio or a quartet. To make that work, I need to have a certain skill level and a certain understanding that this is not my bass. I have to find out what it can do to allow me to do to play this bass. In the meantime, my focus is can I make this bass feel like mine? When that gig is over and the, and the tour is over, my job is to come back to New York, of course. And how quickly can I say hello to my bass and understand that this is what it feels like after not seeing it for nine concerts or eight concerts in terrible conditions, basically. So when I tell her to do that, I, I'm not above acknowledging that rule myself for different reasons, but the same effect is in place, the discipline and the outcome that we hope is a result of this newly, uh, newly introduction, new introduction to being disciplined to get something done yeah. for her. It's different for us I, um, electric players or primarily electric players who just put it over your back, put it in the, uh, the airplane, yeah, you those things too, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The days of, you know, years ago when I was working on my first trip to California, Bobby Timmons, uh, he was with Art Blakey at the time. He just left Art Blakey to put his own trip together with me and the two the Heath. Uh, I found out that the process that Art Blakey used to use was get to the airport at the very last minute and, and walk out and talk to the and let him walk out to the airplane with the base, put the base in the seat because it was too late to do anything else with it. Well, that worked for a couple of times with Bobby Timmons, but that kind of wore out real fast. And yeah, I'm sure. And of course, as, as the planes got smaller and theoretically yeah. more efficient, the bulkhead disappeared, and so did the people who were sitting behind the behind the bulkhead. Their attitude also changed. So we're back. We're back to that. Uh, no base on this tour. You got to take us somewhere, either something there or uh, get a, a travel called flyaway base. You know. But again, when I got home, I had to take my base out of my case and figure out how does this does it still work the same way as it did nine concerts ago, and how quickly can I get back to saying hello? How are you? <laughs> well, I think it's so important. Uh, what what whatever the reason is, uh, whether it's you know that young lady wanting to get back into it or trying to practice. I I I you know of course. Uh, it, it, it's, it, again, it's different with an electric instrument, but you still, you still want the long tones. You still want the articulation to be perfect. So the similarities are, are, are there as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The difference is you can see where you're going. I'm playing my radar all night, every night, you know, <laughs> I don't have the frets or the diamonds in my fingerboard. So I'm, I'm hoping that my sense of how far it is from A, <laughs> A to B flat is the same in most cases, you know? Yeah, yeah. I want to show you something that I, I bought these two books in 1973. Wow. Wow. At the, actually, no, 71, at the Bumblebee Bookstore in Boston, right next to the Berkeley College of Music. Okay. And... I didn't know the MJQ was publishing Ornette's book, Ornette's music. I just saw the publishing at the very bottom of Ornette's book, the MJQ yeah. publishing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess um, I think this was '65. Let me check. And it, it uh, I guess, you know, they they put that out. Actually, it's '68. Um, MJQ Music, 200 West 57th Street. And back then. You know, obviously, all we did going to music school was practice, 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 practice. You had to. But it was interesting because um, you remember John Neves, of course, right? Sure, absolutely. And, and well, Paul? when I walked in with my um, my P bass, he goes, Mr. Gross, the electric bass is not a valid musical instrument. Mm. <laughs> because it was part of that jazz police kind of thing where 
you know, I guess for a lot of folks, it was a difficult thing seeing all of their um, hard work and, and uh, practice sort of being sidestepped to, to rock music. You, of course. I don't know uh, that. I don't know that feeling. I never had that. Man. I, I never felt that uh, mm. Jocko, Jocko was a threat to my livelihood or, or James Jamison or, or Steve Bailey was my dear friend, Victor, Victor, none of those guys. I thought that these are the guys, Monk Montgomery. We had a long talk many, many years ago. He was still with Lionel, after he left Lionel Hampton's band about what he did with the electric bass. I, those guys are my friends. They're my, I'm, I'm a fan of their people, of those people. Sure. Because I watched how they have taken an instrument that was kind of called the pork chop in the slang of the, of the instrument and made it a, a very serious musical event when you see them play, when you hear the results of their effort. Boosie Collins, all those guys, man, they made the bass do something. So when those electric guys got on the scene and became more visible and, and, and uh, they brought their influence not just to the music but to the use of amplification gear and the whole environment, I applauded those guys, man. I yeah, just, well, I, I just what thought, I was going to say is I, I think, huh. you know, you embrace the instrument. Uh, think about, uh, I guess, the first song that comes to my mind is um, Red Clay. What a great bass line. Yeah, well, you know, that only got there because Freddie didn't bring a part in, you know, as in, as in most of the guys to give you, he, he, I got the tune, but just put an intro to it for me. And we had to, they come to downbeat with the guy saying, ready, roll them, you know. Yeah. And we get lucky and we strike the right notes at the right time and, and hope that uh, at the end of the tune, while they don't remember the intro, they won't forget it either. <laughs> well, that's certainly true. That's certainly true. I wanted to talk a bit about um, your, your new book because... Uh, it's a phenomenal idea that, my God, who would have thought? Well, let me get a copy. Uh, Ron, why did why did you pick the tune Autumn Leaves? Well, it was the easiest one. Every, first of all, everyone knows that song, man. Okay. That, that's there the is. presentation, too. Everyone knows that song. And okay. every, every jazz player primarily has played this song at some point in their career, however brief their career was. Whether they work all day at an optometrist shop or at a deli and on weekends with the guys, someone calls that song, man. Mm -hmm. and, and having decided on a process to better show what I think a valuable description transcription can look like, uh, that that song provided me an excellent format. Okay. And uh, as that was the first tune that the Miles Band played nearly every night for five and a half years. Right. And five and a half years of choices to make this process as I envisioned it uh, come to fruition. And, and, and uh, it was it was easy to pick five versions because it was the same personnel. It's, right. a, per it's, a, it's a perfect storm for a great kind of uh, analysis, a great kind of laboratory. We had the same Controlled band. experiment, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. We had the same band, we had the same song, we had the same basic format. Uh, the temples changed depending on factors they're out of our control which is part of an experiment right sometimes we get to the gig right from the airport to the bandstand uh, on those gigs we never had out to had the same instruments they were all different piano different drums different bass we never had a sometimes had no sound check sure. uh, oh. it was a really really the essence of a perfect place to try these experiments given the mm -hmm. distance between each performance and, and with a lot of help from dave Barron and boots Mallison, we figured out this is a way to make my view of making transcriptions more valid. Right. In this case, not only do you have a bass line, but you have a whole song to a total of, in this case, total of four choruses times five different performances. And at the beginning of each sheet of the new plan, you have a QR, a QR code which allows you to hear what you're looking at. So you can actually see how the bass line, not how the bass line not only evolves for the four choruses, but four choruses times five versions. Mm -hmm. You can hear how Herbie and, and Tony and Miles are waiting for this next um, bass from the guy who's hiding behind a palm tree. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> where he's going to take him. And it's a, it's a great view of, uh, of a transcription that's completely complete. Mm -hmm. rather, rather than just a bass line on page three of the book. 
some of my lines are there and I'm not against them doing that. I just think that right. kind of leading them down the wrong way to think that this baseline is the ultimate baseline. It may be a great line. My question, which is why I came up with this view of this transcription book, that you can see how the line started out. You can see how how he, how he affected the band's process. Right. You can see the baseline developed over four or five times. And even better, you see how the band re responds to this information. Right. Now, you hear Herbie not play a chord, but he plays this chord because he remembers the last time. Or we, I will play a six eight rhythm in January and, and in March we, I do it again. But Tony's on; he's all over. He's playing three four against my six eight, <laughs> and Herbie's downbeat. You know, and Miles is trilling because he's not quite sure where we're going, but he knows that I'll find one somewhere <laughs> between <laughs> then, and then and now. So it's a perfect storm for me, and this is what I hope that 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 not just bass, but I hope piano players will buy this book, okay. so they can hear how Herbie is mm. affected by what the bass player plays. Wow. But they can hear how Tony is waiting for my next rhythmic move and how he borrows something that I already played the last concert with this song. Okay. How he, he uses that information because he hears it coming again and how he responds. It's, it's that kind of group transcription that we happen to stumble on as we were trying to make the baseline as important as we think it is, be better demonstrated as really being important. We got mm -hmm. lucky with the concept, but it's, it's, I think it's a very valid way. And I would like to think that that base departments, wherever they are, will get involved in the base camps. You know, they, they have 40 kids at camp trying to play jazz. But look, get them this book, man, so they can see some additional options that no one's right. going to show them unless they have this kind of transcription like this, you know? Well, what I also found um, completely an embrace of the modern technology is the QR codes. Yeah, that's great, I mean, man. Think Isn't that about, something? Think about... <laughs> how many records I have destroyed or you have destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I'll put the quarter on top. Oh, that'll slow it down just that much. Well, if I put three quarters on top, it'll get even slow, but the pitch is gonna change. Yeah. Uh, right. You have, have come up, well, quick, that's it. I can watch this a million times. Yes, uh, yeah, that, that's a fantastic. Uh, wow, uh, how how great is that? Yeah. And yeah. and the, the, you know, when you look at the uh well the first version, all right, the 63 version, uh, and Monterey. You're doing your first chorus, and then the second chorus we go from a C minor seven, next chord's a C sharp diminished. So not only is a bass player learning, oh, I go here. But then the, the, the important concept to me was, well, why is it a C sharp diminished? What, okay, so that's an E, so that's uh, mm, ah, oh, so that's why we're doing that. And I think that's even more important than the actual note is the, if, if you know what I'm saying, is sure. yeah, yeah. there's an incredible amount of theory there. There's so much to learn just from bar one to bar two. Yeah, and, and what's important for me is they see at the beginning of the book, the original changes. Yes, yeah. yes. We, right. we started from somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yep. and, and we all would agree where that somewhere was, which is also important. They got to know where I'm starting with them and them with me, so that when my options are made visible, they understand they're based on this version of these chords that we all agree on are good changes. You know, my, my job, I think, most a bass player's job is to play the kind of chords that make the, the horn players do like this with their eyebrows, you know, and say, oh, man, now what? <laughs> you know, now, That's great. It, now it, it, what? <laughs> and I also think the fact that you took the same song over five years and, and to hear the, well, from 63 to 68, just take those two. And, and listen to them first. And then, oh, wow, where did it go? How did it evolve? Yeah. 64, 65, 66, to find out. Uh, really, it, it, I'm excited about it. I, I'm, I'm fascinated with it. And it, 
for me personally, I'm going to go back and listen to a lot of other tunes and do the exact same thing. Now, just like you, I'm not going to write them out. <laughs> <laughs> The, the last thing I ever wrote out, Keith Copeland had me do the rhythm to the entire um, uh, Ahmad Jamal, um, what, what was it, a Ponciana. Oh, Just wow. write out the rhythm. Oh, man. What a, <laughs> the last a one. I thought he was a friend. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Although I'll tell you, I did write a, a, a you'll like this story because you love uh, Eric Dolphy. So Downbeat wanted me to do a workshop um, column. And I said, all right, I'll transcribe, God bless the child. And the, just the bass clarinet, solo bass. So about a week into it, I call <laughs> Downbeat and say, hey, what if I took four four-bar phrases and then show you how you can use them as an educational piece? They said, oh, that's a great idea. And I went, thank God, because I hate transcribing, so... so. <laughs> You asked for a, you asked for a tremendous work to be get that because I know I know that piece and it's really hard. You know, yeah. speaking of, of transcription, one of the things that I think bass teachers who want to show the kids bass lines, they will show them a transcribed bass line and have them play it through the keys. And, and that that couldn't be any worse thing to do. First of all, uh, Dave, I'm not sure how many kids bass players, grown ups or not, are going to have the kind of skill level literally to play a bass line that Paul Chambers' bass line or Ray Brown's bass line or mine. Secondly, I'm not sure they can find out where the notes are located given the difference in skill level that these kids have, these, these beginning bass players have. And, and, and the third thing I worry about is that if they learn this bass line in the key of B flat, or, or D flat, for example, just a transcribed bass line from Oscar Petty for the so. Right. If they don't play a song in D flat all night, that bass line is useless to them. Right. Right. And, and the bass line in D flat won't sound the same as G. Right. Or C. Yeah. Yeah. Or no, F. you're absolutely right. You know, so it's, it's doing them a disservice, them a disservice not only in, in consuming that valuable time, but having them misunderstand this line that just transcribed. Uh, in and of itself is not transferable, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. You know, and, and that's why when when someone calls Autumn Leaves, it's going to start on a C minor. That's just the way it is. Yeah. So why would you want them to do it in, let's say, G flat? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just, and, and especially if they start getting involved with other guys who are equally harmonically curious, you know, and, and who are willing to accept a bass player's set of notes as being something really worthwhile for them to investigate. You know, they aren't, they aren't going to put in the key that limits that bass player's options because they want to find out what, the, what he can do for us tonight. You know, right, when, right. when, when, the, when this theory class open, you know? Yeah. I, well, I, you I, know, I, one, one thing I would have suggested uh, with the autumn leaves thing, your version on the Chet Baker record. Mm. Is, that was uh, the, 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 uh, Paul Desmond? Yes. Um, what is it? She was too good. Uh, she was um, too good for me or something like that. Yeah. 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 That should have been the next one because you do some of the most and, and your tone and it, that's a beautiful recording. That whole album is just a beautiful album too. It's a good uh, sound that day. But you're also in starting on a C minor. Go figure. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that was, again, you know, when you try those harmonic alterations and, and the new changes, uh, one of the things I have always, I kind of start to tell myself in my head when I get to these gigs, even if they're not my band kind of gigs, you know, mm -hmm. uh, before I do my harmonic experiments and go into my laboratory, I want the band leader and the guys in the band, the person in the band, to know that I really know this tune. I really know how it started out. Yeah, yeah. And so by the third chorus, I hope I've convinced them enough that it allows me to play their first chord, first note on Autumn Lee's E flat. <laughs> I'm not lost. No, you're in a flat third. I got a, I got a plan here. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> well, that's great. There, there's something that you did with Tim Wells, that the director, and I'm not picking apples. <laughs> I got a plan. I, yeah, yeah. I've, I've co-opted it. I do give you credit, but I have co-opted it. I love apples too. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Yeah. Very, very, very cool. And, uh, and again, you know, one of the things we ho I hope with this book is the kids can see how your notes do in fact, in fact, affect everything above it. Right. Yeah. They're a catalyst. Yeah. 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 You know, it isn't from the top down. It's from the bottom up for us. Right. That's exactly right. That's great. Uh, I had a few other interesting... Oh, um, I think you... you uh, have fun with your mistakes. Yeah, that, that, that's, you, you get better, man. <laughs> you, you make better mistakes. You yeah. get great ideas. Well, you know, one thing I hope that this book, this chartography also encourages the baseball to understand that they have always have choices. They will never run out of things to do. But that depends on them remembering what they played. Hmm. I mean, we all have our little crips. To, we used to call them bags back in the old days. You know, open up our bag and play this. Da 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 da. We <laughs> yeah. all we, we all have those, man. Yeah. And along the way, we find things that lead up to that kind of stuff. My hope is that when they look at this book, they will question, "How did we get there?" Other than we got there, well, one was we remembered the things that worked and developed those things to another level. That's critical yeah. for us. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because this book really, um, it, it goes in line with uh, the comprehensive base method, uh, making the changes. I mean, everything fuses together. Yes. But I had a question. Uh, I want to go back to that, but there was something else that, you know, struck me. Uh, you know, when you were starting out and, and when most people pre-YouTube, let's say, or pre-any of that stuff, you started with a Samandel book or an Edward Nene or something like that. Do you find that the modern day bass player learning jazz sort of doesn't get into the original Samandel? In other words, they start with jazz. They don't because uh, yeah. I know you're you're a, a, a big proponent um, of foundations. Sure. Well, I know where you're going with this, and one of my one of my my second craw, so to speak, in my throat, is I think bass teachers, jazz bass teachers, generally, don't increase the students' skill level as they become more and more involved with working more gigs. Mm -hmm. That they want to know how to play, dude. That the comp basic bass line on the bottom, you know, and that's always good, you know. Or, or things, you know, tricks that they learn that they can show this bass player, but they don't increase the kids, the bass player's skill level that will allow him to find his own way physically on the bass. And that limits his choices because he can't find the notes that he's starting to hear. Or the piano player who likes Bill Evans or Herbie Hancock is going to play a new voicing that they won't find on the on a Ramsey Lewis record or, or an, even an Amjamal record, and his notes have got to find a way to make that new piano voicing. Right. Or the new guitar, guitar voicing work. But unless he can find these notes by knowing his instrument, he'll have a difficult time satisfying his curiosity and the band's hiring him because he's not playing the right notes because he can't find them. Right. And, and, and I say that not to jump on bass teachers' case necessarily, but to encourage them that they gotta find out how the bass works better so they can tell the kid, yeah, this, bass line is, this bass line is nice, but he found these notes because he was in his hand was positioned this way. He knew that this note was F on the D string, but it's also these notes across the string. They shift this way. I mean, they have to know that really basic, there we go again with one S this time, basic info to make him have him or her have the choices that the music is presenting them. Right. Well, you know, it, it's interesting you say that because um, somewhere in your biography, uh, which is another book everyone needs to, um, to purchase, it, it's fascinating, uh, you talk about going on a gig and everyone was doing some modal stuff and you went, oh, I know that. I learned that 
in my classical studies. And it just seems we're, we're getting away from the basic foundations. YouTube has become a bit of a, a, a crutch in a way. Oh, I can learn these half a dozen songs, boom. I can get out and do a gig versus I can learn to play my instrument. Yeah, well, you know, they, they see the results before they see the work that goes into it, I think. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, they, they see uh, Ray, Ray, they see uh, Christian, they see, they see all, the, all the good guys who really play the bass well and how they do. They don't understand that those guys started with the mandal at page nine. Yeah. Page, page mm -hmm. nine is, this is a bass and this is the open strings. <laughs> That's it. You know? That's it. I One, mean, even back when uh, Rufus Reed's book came out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, good books too, by the way. Oh, yeah. great book. Uh, ex except the part on how to hold the electric bass, those pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go there, man. <laughs> that's my show i can <laughs> you know one of, the that, one of the things i tell the parents who are very concerned about their daughter and son taking the string bass you know the weight the cost you know i tell them you know one of the first stories i heard about the jokes i heard about the string bass was this young kid is nagging his father to take to, to be a musician he wanted to be a bass player because he saw you know he, he it was loud did all the things you know uh, and, and uh, uh, so he said his father bought him the bass finally and uh, so he goes to school for the first lesson you know and he comes home about an hour later and his dad says well son how was it, how was the bass lesson today he said well it's okay you know the next lesson he goes a week later you know he goes and he goes and he comes back an hour and a half later and, and, and uh, the, the, the father says uh, why are you late today he said I learned the names of the strings today you know, his, his father's very impressed because he sees, he does some music, but he knows progress. Right. You know? And so the third week, he takes the kids, takes, takes the weeks to school, and, and uh, he comes back one hour and 25 minutes later. And the guy said, hey, son, what's, what's going on here, you know? He said, well, today I learned the strings, E-A-D-G. And his father's thrilled because his son maybe starting to read a little music from the, from the old days, right? He goes to school for the fourth lesson. He doesn't come home. He, he come, doesn't go home for two days. And his father's getting frantic. Him, what happened? His, his son finally comes and says, son, what happened to you? He said, dad, I had a gig. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, has, it has been known to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, I think uh, uh, Tom and David, once the bass player understands the control they have over the music and how important their notes really are and how they can literally control the direction of the band, they'll stop and say, well, how, how can I find these notes? If that's so powerful, how can I find these notes? Your note is a different color. Yeah, we're back, we're back to this page nine in Samando. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and that, this thing, because I remember I, I got Rubis's book and I got Samando's book. Yeah, great combination, later, man. In, yeah, they threw in Edward Nane. Yeah. Which was actually a little more painful because the book was... <laughs> I can't put it in my bag. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 in Italian. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it. <laughs> Tom, you had some interesting questions. Well, you know, you mentioned we were talking about digital media and YouTube and things, and just the fact that this book has uh, QR codes. Uh, Ron, reflect over, you know, the value of digital media now with YouTube and streaming services. I more now more than ever. I have more access to jazz than ever before. It can also be used as an educational tool. You know, we can we can go back and watch the masters. We can go watch, you know, Paul Chambers. We can see the footage of this. And and it's also, you know, it, it works as not only an educational, but an inspirational tool. Well, you know, all that's true, but it yeah. still starts with a live performance between you and your teacher. And I think because we have so much YouTube available to us, it, it misleads these kids to think that there's nothing to it and I can really do it yeah. by myself, you know. Mm. For all, all the questions I'm asked whenever I do 
interviews and, and, and master classes, you know, one thing I've always said, underlined, that the bass player, whoever he or she is, they need a teacher. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I never say a bass teacher, but of course that's, that's implied, you know. Right. But then someone has to show them the instrument, how to hold it, what's right. the size they need, how, how to change the strings, what's the correct height for the strings, you know, what's the correct, how to hold the bass. And in Canada, guys, I've seen bass players who uncase the bass by laying it on the floor. They take the bass out of the case with the bass laying literally uh, uh, horizontally on the floor. And then when I saw that happen, I said, man, how do you, why do you do that? He said, that's what we all do. I said, well, the jazz clubs in, in New York that I know, man, it's big enough for piano and upright piano, a, a big enough for a set of drums, upright piano and one microphone stand. There's no place on this bandstand if that's how you're going to uncase your bass to make this gig, because there's no room up there. You know, uh, YouTube, for all the advantages that they are for the young people, they give them a false sense of history also, I think. And because they don't see, never saw Paul Chambers practice. They never heard him have a teacher. They just see this great, wonderful playing, Ray Brown. What a fat stuff. And, and I think part of my generation's, Christian Bryce generation, is to encourage the kids. Yeah, those guys were, are, are what they are. But they started with page nine of Samando. Right. And, and yeah, they meant it. Back there. Yeah, yeah, they meant it. But again, you know, I've never seen Oscar Pettiford play live. And now, when I came to New York, he started to go into Europe. You know, I, I missed that. And unfortunately, by the, at that time, there were not, the, the social media wasn't so big. So guys like that, I wish I could see those guys. And how, you know, hear him play live and see how he held the bass and see how he found those great notes because he wrote for the bass perfectly, man. You know, tricketism, swinging till the girls come home. All those two, they did it perfectly written for the instrument. How did he play them? I want to see how he got those notes. You know, well, these kids today, they can see how I'm trying to find them. They can see how Ray Brown tries to find them. They can see how Christian Brown, Christian McBride finds them, ruthless. They can see how we find them. And I rule that I didn't have the opportunity when I was their age, but I'm not upset because I didn't see it. I just wasn't the time of the development of cameras and sneaking videos and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's interesting too because uh, think of well, my wife and I right now are working on a documentary on Slim Galliard. Oh, wow. uh, so uh, yeah, Mark, his son is. Uh, uh, helping us with this. And uh, when, when you think about Slam's Arca, you know darn well that there was a Samandel book or something yeah, yeah. in his yeah. hands. Yeah, even yeah. Uh, even um, Bam, Bam Brown. You, know, you cannot play like that. No. Paul Chambers, he has been listening with the breast with the first bass of the, with the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, you know. Uh, that slam stood, stood on, on uh, Town Hall 1944 with uh, Don Bias. Fantastic. Okay. Oh. And you know, regarding uh, uh, Oscar Pettiford, uh, I, I think Deep Passion may be one of uh, the, uh, my Desert Island okay. tunes. Yeah. yeah. And, and because he not only was he playing great bass, but his orchestration. Yeah, the, the, I mean, he wrote. Right, her, yeah, or, or some some Georgia Vivier ar arrangements back in the day. You, a great arranger, you know. We 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 the bass collective don't just play the bass. <laughs> you know, That's we just don't, we just had guy the last guy to leave the gig because we got to pack up the bass and the amp. You know, yeah. we do That's other it. things too, like write great arrangements. You know, yeah, yeah. Rufus Reed writes some great big big group arrangements, big originals, just lovely writing. So we do something else besides play Roots. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's, a, it's a wonderful thing, too. <laughs> no doubt about it. Yeah. Once again, you know, you start on an E flat. Uh, <laughs> I like that a lot. Uh, it's, it's, it's funny, too, because if, if you really think about it, it's it, it, with a seventh chord, the fifth for the most part, is is the is the odd note out. You can't really tell. Is it a major? Is it a minor? But that third, that third tells you everything. Yeah, 
speaking of, of my book, there's a story in there. Uh, one of the questions I'm often asked in these kind of talk events, you know, uh, did Miles ever tell you what to play? Because that's the mm -hmm. reputation he's kind of uh, uh, earned over the years due to no one really knowing what he talks about. You know, they say, hey, man, well, did he ever tell you what to play? So I tell him this uh, short story. We were doing Autumn Leaves. And uh, I just had kind of had enough of playing the G minor for the last chord, the dominant seven, going back to the top of the tune. Yep. So I wait till the fourth beat of that last measure and play the B natural. Right. <laughs> and uh, every, everybody does this, you know, and they don't want to do it. So, <laughs> um, after about two or three bars of Wayne's solo, Miles walks behind me and pulls my chord and says, what was that note? I said, it's B natural, make that G minor chord, the G7. A natural way to go to C minor. Don't talk. Don't talk to me because I can't talk back to him. Play at the same time, you know. But that be natural. I said third. You talk about. You know. It's, everyone expects a G when they want a G minor. I said no, no. G seven, man. And go back to the top of the C right there. It's perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that's so true. You know. And and how you look at it as a G seven. I'm I'm just thinking. Oh, it's just the passing tone below, but it has its own function. Absolutely, it is a third. Yes. Yeah. And this has gone on in real time. Yeah. Yeah. And of well, course, you know the trick is. So, yeah, so you're, 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 you've got your plan. You're not yeah. just picking apples. Picking apples. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be your new book. I'm not <laughs> just picking apples. Well, no, the, we're thinking about doing another version of this this time. Uh, Using a blues with the Miles Band or something like that for oh, four okay. versions because they really got kind of outrageous, man. The harmony, <laughs> harmony, harmony, and rhythm. I mean, you can't play walking but so many ways with stop. You can't, but I'm going outside some kind of way, you know. And we, true. And we haven't decided what the next part two of this is, but we're we're on to some I think some nice ideas here. How long did that book take? How long did photography take? Uh, I guess about four months, okay. all total. Yeah. Now, did you have the concept that we're going to have the songs, we're going to have uh, the various harmonies, we're going to work it out? Or did somebody help you with the quote-unquote technical aspects of things? Uh, I'm not sure what I mean technical. I had someone help me transcribing it. They no, no. I, I mean, like, for instance, uh, at, 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 at the very beginning in, in your key uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> to it, uh, Numbers occur, uh, the three over four rhythmic idea you had. Um, well, the, the idea, yeah, that kind of stuff was a combination of everybody. The I called my office manager who works the printing this stuff out, and uh, Dave Barron and Bruce Mouth, the colors. What, what's the best color they have on the book to get their attention, mm -hmm. given the amount of information on each page? I mean, look at the page, page, uh, page three. You got three different colors on there, would have the significant impact on what you're going to hear mm -hmm. and to decide the right color and, and how dark is it and when you make multiple co copies is it going to fade out you know and are they easy to go back to the first page and say oh number three means that number four means that and this new e flat seven with this different kind of color that means that and those decisions it was a group decision you know we yeah. have a, a chord change they would say we say what it is and we would find try to figure out what's the best color for the uh, different harmonies we use and what's the best color to outline what rhythms re occur somewhere else so they can go back to the chart and say oh yeah that's that rhythm that we heard in the first version number three or wherever it is so that kind of physical manipulation of information was a group a, a, a very very actively an equal opportunity choice words a necessary point of view to make this kind of thing come off but before well, my talk the reason i asked is um book two is going to be a lot faster because you got all that down that, that's in, in theory but depends on what the tune is going to be too oh that's, that's right <laughs> yeah. well if you're not transcribing it's going to be like <laughs> for those guys <laughs> <laughs> one of the things i want to ask you uh, ron i mean your career spans the record album the a track the cassette uh, the CD, I have a record collection back there. You'll find Peg Leg and Dear Miles and mm -hmm. All Blues and uh, other records. Uh, but now we're in the streaming world. Um, and I know some of your records didn't come out 
in the United States. You're a reporter for Japanese label. Um, David and I like to know, do you think it's the best of times or the worst of times? Because now you as an artist can go directly uh, to an audience. You don't have to sell your record or convince your record company to put something out. So is the power all in the hands of the artist now? Well, you know, I'm a little concerned about that because the audience has a chance to disrupt my story. Mm -hmm. When I make a record, I have a plan. I have a plan in my mind. Right. I pick, I pick the right keys, the right order of songs, the right, right the running. Yeah. And for them to just pick track three of my record, that destroys my story. Mm -hmm. In yes. in theory, of course, you know. Right. And, and I would like to have them hear how that third tune fits into the, the whole record. So that's kind of out of my control now that the streaming is kind of taking over that part of the presentation. Yes, that's playlists uh, are a fact of life now. Well, they're, they're a fact. I'm not sure of yeah. life, but it's clearly a fact. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, a fact of life is that they're, they're underpaying us. That's a fact of life. Well, that's, that's another issue. And, and, and uh, there's a, a movement now that's starting to get some momentum that the powers, whoever they are that be, I call them the non-stripers, uh, have a chance to make the pay a lot more equal than it has been. Uh, many, within the past few years, musicians thought the solution to uh, not getting the royalties, whatever they would amount to, would be to put their own record out. Right. So they had their own labels. But that was fraught with as many problems because they didn't pay the guys who were publishers of their songs that they recorded. They were not originals. Right. right. You, you know, so that, that, that itself had its issues. That was not a, a complete solution because the solution is bigger than just having your own record label. Right. You still have distribution, right? Yeah. What does that really mean? No, not just distribution. You, you record a Herbie Hancock tune. You record a, a Rodgers and Hart song. You record a Malte. Who pays those guys? But for you, the publishers, the writers, they're supposed to get paid. And these independent, the, probably the independent guys who are doing the they never occurred to them that it's not pure profit, man. You got to pay all these bills the, after you make the disc. Right. It isn't just going to the studio. You know? A streaming, it seems to make the music more immediately available. I just right. don't care for the order which is made that they have a chance to listen to a record that's out of order, which is out of the order which I recorded it because it's a package for me. Right. It's like buying a book and read page and starting to, starting to page seven. Well, who, who does that? Well, the listeners of jazz records. <laughs> really? That's okay? No, I'm not okay. Having said that, streaming is the way it is, and we just hope that some kind of way we can balance out the clearly unequal payment process. Right. And, uh, we can kind of get on with our business of making music and be con not be so concerned with being taken advantage of one more time. Right. Right. I know you commented in, in, in the book, uh, in uh, Dan's book, about uh, just the aesthetic of the album, whereas the CD medium, uh, I believe you commented, was a little bit too long. An LP was about 37, 40 minutes, where the CD extended that to 75 minutes, which might be too much information. And of course, there's the whole, the beauty of, of the artwork of an album cover. Yeah, well, you know, one of the reasons I think that the CD length was detrimental to the artist was I'm not sure guys how many artists we could think of uh, of the younger generation just for that can put together a, a story for 75 minutes right. and have everyone read every chapter I haven't seen that I haven't, I'm sure someone has done that because I said it's difficult I'm sure they'll find nine guys will say hey man I did that you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But again, if you use looking for standards, the kind of blues like no more than 37 minutes, man. That's it, yeah. And the music is incredible. Not just that it's sold out of record. Oh, yeah, all right. But the fact is, every track has value. And every track is a strong statement. Besides being new for its time. That's a, that's a given. And I'm not so sure that, that a record that's 65 minutes long has the internal wherewithal to make everyone want to buy this record because it's got so much music on it. Total music. Yeah, yeah. You know? It makes uh, a great deal of sense. Uh, it, and, it's and the guys in Japan, they, they, they said, Mr. Carter, don't make a record any more than 50 minutes. That was their limit. Wow. You know? Yeah. They understood well, that. Plus, plus, as kids, I, I, you know, I would, I would study an album cover, oh, yeah. even if there were no words on it. 
yes. you know? And, and if you think about it, 30, 40 minutes of staring at a record with no words is probably enough. But by the time you're done, the, the record is finished. Uh, and no, the, the very, very good point. Uh, do we have 75 minutes of, maybe that's why streaming has, you know, maybe that's one of the reasons why. But I don't know, who are we talking to, um, Tom, about a greatest hits album? It was Rudy Sarza. Yeah, that it, right, how he disdained greatest hits albums because like you said, Ron, it was disrupting the story sure. of the yeah. album. Yeah. You know, and, and again, you know, I, I guess it's okay to have your music put out wherever the form you can get it because right. Right, you know, the, everything is changing and being eliminated and made smaller along the way. You know, we're concerned right now is how many jazz clubs, how many jazz clubs are going to be in action once they <laughs> open it up, whatever that finally means. Uh, so that's maybe one or two less locations for us to experiment. Right. Our laboratory is getting smaller and smaller, and to have a, a greatest hits kind of thing, it really even dilutes our worth, musical yeah. and, and musical worth, because it's in the wrong place, you know. And I think nowadays the record companies, you know, with no disrespect to um, young people, but uh, when you have bean counters basically handling everything, uh, you know, at least in the 70s and 80s, for me, you know, which were my, you know, mostly gigging years, the A&R people and the business people were passionate about music. Now we've gotten to the point where we have accountants doing the music. It's not the same thing. So, yeah, yeah, you know, David, I'm not quite. I, I would add to that statement a footnote saying that it isn't just the bean counters are in change, but the people who are the producers. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure their historical background, their historical leaning toward the background of this music has been carried over to the current view of the current people who are calling the shots, who determine who gets the record date, what they're going to record, that kind of stuff. I think those people are a different breed right now. Yeah. I, I give you an example. You know, years ago, when they would have commercials, they would always have, if there was a, a music, whether a video with guys on, they would hire a real jazz player to play, to hold the bass correctly, and the saxophone wouldn't be held with the wrong hands. But right. the, the producers knew the music. You know, they, they knew who Coleman Hawkins was, you know, they knew who Ben Webster was, you know, they knew Train before he was trained, you know, and so they, they wanted some authenticity to this project so they would know what, what a saxophone should be held. I, I think I think the current bunch of producers, and I hope they don't call my house day after tomorrow, I think they're not so concerned, they're not so aware of that part of the music that, that, that the old guy, that the older generation was, and and they've kind of gotten another view of how best to present this music. Uh, okay, that's that's their view. Uh, it clearly is contrast to the influence that the producers had, Ashwin Ashwin Nerd and, and Ashwin Nerdic, Erdic and, and and Bob Porter and 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 uh, Esmond Edwards, you know George Avakian, that bunch of people. They knew the history because they were a part of the history. Yes. And I think the current producers, because they were not physically a part of that history, they've kind of decided that it wasn't too much there for them to worry about because it's past them. Mm. Sad, but probably very, very true. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's okay. Uh, I want to be wrong you know, every now and then, you know, <laughs> except the thirds. I'm just saying they're always right. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, Ron, to continue on near COVID intermission, let me add, let me put the question to you, okay. Ron Carter. What's the first thing you're going to do on the gig? I'm going to look around and say, where have you guys been? Yeah. Uh, we, we've had some group conversations over the past year, yeah. year and a half or so, just to just to get a, get a feeling of, mm. of of how much we're missing each other, you know, yeah. and. Uh, I, uh, Someone was putting together a, a tribute to uh, uh, Bill at uh, Chick Corea, and uh, they have have having piano players play some of Chick Corea's library, 
and and I was asked to be a, they asked a piano player to play one of the chicks tunes and the piano player called me to be an assistant to them and it was yeah it's, it's, I can do that and uh, I think I even knew the song because I recorded with a chick at some point you know back in the, or back in the day but it's just nice to be out in the street with a a, a live musician you know and in in a real situation of a studio with some real recording engineers who aren't part-time, who are really doing this job right, and this tremendous awakening of those kind of feelings that we were all suppressing for 15 months or so, you know? It's a, a great thing to do, and the piano player was out of sight, and I said, well, we gotta do this again. Yeah, five months from now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must say the Vanguard does a loving job of streaming. Even yeah. though no one's in the audience, at least the music's out there. They get a great sound too, man. Those guys, oh, those, those guys know how to do it. Yes, yeah. absolutely. They hit the, it's perfect. It's like, it's, it's not like being there, but it's as close as you can get and not be there. Because well, I think the, perfect, the, man. Yeah, I think the benefit for that is now that they know how to do the film shoot, now how they know how to do the recording for it. When people are in the audience, now people who aren't in the audience are going to be able to benefit from it too. So I think there will be uh, a good thing from it like that. Right. I hope so because they're nice and they're all nice kids. I call them kids because they're 25. They're kids to me. They are, they're really nice people who yeah. care about the music and they care about the visual presentation of this music. Yeah, it was obvious. I've, I've watched a number of them. There was a great one. Well, you've worked with Bill Frizzell. He did a yeah. great one with Thomas Morgan. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, I mean, it, it, it's so crystal clear to see and crystal clear to hear. It's beautiful. Sure. It's yeah, really it's perfect. Yeah. yeah. However, that will not be the solution to this music. No. No. We cannot survive on that. Right. Hmm. Or right. need to get the clubs. It's it's nice a nice it's a nice thing to do. We need that interaction, but it's it's not gonna it's not gonna it, it will not what's the right word it will not encourage that presentation too many more times once the clubs open. Okay, okay. We have a special event, you know. Okay, you know, because you don't yeah. do it. But I think that to say you can have one night a week streaming to that no, don't do that. I see what you're saying. Yes. Yeah, I understand. So, so, Ron, how do you explain to people what it's not, what it's like to not play a gig for 15 months? Uh, I just tell them what I've been busy doing. I have, I'm teaching 10 private students online. Right. I'm, I've worked on this chartography for three months of that, four months of that time, plus other books. Uh, I've accepted that I can't play with them until it's okay to play with them. You know, and I understand that that decision is completely out of our control. We, 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 all of us, the jazz community in this case, have lost so much work and so much, so much, so much of a chance to experiment. You know, one of the things I missed most of all, uh, Tom and David, is not having to make those decisions. I have to worry about the tune of the order, the speed. What key? The solo. Who solos? How long do they solo? What happens if the audience doesn't respond to the song I want them to respond to? For 15 months, man, I haven't had that grief, which is a lovely part of being a band leader. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I was, right now I'm enjoying taking the garbage out on time, going to the laundry, <laughs> walk to the post office, you know? I've been loving that kind of stuff. And now come, come uh, September when Broadway opens and New York starts to get more busy. Those those pleasures of house being will be limited because I'm out there doing what I used to do, working. <laughs> so I try to explain that sense to people when they ask me, well, what do you do? How do you feel about not working? And, and uh, when people ask you, what are you not working? What do you think about? Bad, you know? I miss being responsible, but I have other responsibilities now that I'm responsible for, and I don't, I don't shirk those at all. Makes sense. Excuse me for a second. I got to let one of our dogs in. Okay. But I think there's going to be a tremendous response once we finally can get back to the clubs. Absolutely. Yeah. It's going to be great because everyone, everyone misses it. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Even those, even those who didn't get out. 
who were not jazz fans go to go to the club. They missed that kind of interaction because, you know, one thing that's great about New York, man, is you can, you can hear jazz anytime, any day. Yeah. Yeah. Even, even if you don't make a point to go hear it, you know, <laughs> walk down the street, there it is. Well, for 15 months, you walk down the street and you hear this. You know? That. Do you, ha do you have and anything? Do you have anything specifically booked beginning in September? Uh, if I say I do, then it'll be canceled because the Cuomo says it's too soon. So I, <laughs> 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 I hope he gets this issue straightened out. But so I, I can't say where I'm going to be other than uh, practicing that C major, damn C major scale again. Another day, it's like that sucker, right, man? <laughs> That's <laughs> <what I'm gonna> <laughs> <laughs> all right all right david anything else we want to discuss or no i i, I what i wanted to do was talk about the book what i wanted That's to do it. stay <laughs> away from what everyone else talks about <laughs> oh what'd you think of miles what is it oh no 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i hope you had fun yes i did and that's why i'm still sitting down and enjoying the conversation all right so great. you're on tonight one of the things I've, I've noticed, guys, is that when I get certain phone calls from people, it's because they want to talk to a different adult. <laughs> and right now, I'm, I'm enjoying talking to a different adult. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, tonight on our show, we've got Barry Colstein. Wow. We're, we're talking about setting up bases, how to buy an upright, uh, some of his Scott stories. Lafar, the, the restoration of the Scott of Scott's Prescott base, too. That's yeah. right, the Prescott yeah. base and everything. Uh, you will be next Monday. And uh, let's see, who else have we got up? Uh, actually, Harvey Brooks is the week after. Harvey oh. Brooks? Yeah. Good to hear that. Well, you got active, what? You got, you got an active uh, calendar there. Oh, yeah. The week after is Jim Fielder. Mm, mm, okay. And uh, do, do you know, um, uh, do you remember a band called Fairport Convention? They were mm. sort of an English folky rock band. Mm. Well, the guitar player wrote a book called B-Swig, and his name's Richard Thompson. Fabulous musician, great guitar player. We're interviewing because we're not going to start branching out. Uh, uh, not just bass players, you know, uh, people who have come out with books. I think we're going to do uh, uh, an interview with Peter Frampton. He just oh, released yeah. a new book. Really? Yeah, yeah. So, he wrote a don't book? Forget. Yeah, yeah. Um, Autobiography. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't remember the words. <laughs> it's the name of the book. <laughs> uh, and, and then, of course, we're... Um, we had a nice conversation with Michael Manring. That was good. We did Larry Greenwich here. Really? Yeah. yeah. Larry, Larry's a he, he plays good too, man. Larry. Oh, he's fabulous. Yeah. 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 Great like, reverence for you. Like he studied answer. with you. Yeah. Is he still in Europe? Is he still commuting back and forth to Europe? He's in Hudson oh, Valley, well, I think, isn't he? He's up in Hudson now, or or yeah. wherever it is up. I, no, oh, Kingston. New York. Yeah. Okay. He, he was going back and forth to teaching in Europe a couple of weeks a year. Yeah. yeah. Something Switzerland, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. And we also spoke with uh, Benny Reitveld, who was with Miles for a while. He's been uh, Carlos Santana's uh, musical director for the last 30 oh, years. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, Benny, great, great player. I, I don't know him at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he's just check out any Santana record for the last 30 years, and that's Benny. Okay. Yeah, so. All right, gentlemen. Well, Ron, we'll see you tonight on your uh, um, tonight's meeting. You got your Zoom meeting tonight? Yeah. They have interesting questions, so I, I have my hands full, but I think I'll find some nice things to say, and and uh, <laughs> I, I won't get too many calls on my on my line saying, hey, man, you didn't say that, right? You didn't really say that, did you? Yes, I really said that. So it's coming, though. The best part about it with this show is all I have to do at 8 o'clock is press play, so I won't miss your show. <laughs> <laughs> you guys you guys, too much. Fortunately, I'm still sitting down, and you're not, you're not talking over my head, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, Ron, thanks for talking. Guys. Thanks. Wonderful. See you later. Wonderful. Bye bye. <laughs>